created a presentation that is going to be kind of like the road to prohibition and then the path to legalization. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself because we want this to be kind of like an open discussion. So I'm going to disclose a few things about myself. I went to Stanford Law School after college. And you would think that Stanford Law School would be a pretty conservative law school experience. Uh, for most law students it was, but for me it was very different. Um, there were these uh, housing uh, cooperatives at Stanford, and one of them was named the Enchanted Broccoli Forest, where my Keefe dealer lived. And so I was exposed to the psychedelic undergraduate and graduate culture at Stanford uh, going there for law school. There was a literary society called Alpha Delta Phi, the Alpha Delts, and they had an initiation which consisted of going to the hills of Stanford where th the dish, this is like a radar dish, uh, was located on a full moon and taking LSD and having an initiation ceremony. Um, and when I was at Stanford, um, the DEA was onto Stanford students synthesizing LSD, so they would carefully control all the precursors. No precursors to get to Stanford, all strictly controlled. So Stanford students would not be deterred by this. They just invented new ways to synthesize precursors, and once they had their precursor, they would synthesize LSD. And when I was in, in law school, you know, in the um, spirit of like openness and disclosing my own psychedelic experiences, I had the good fortune of having access to some of the purest LSD uh, at the time on Earth, and it was all manufactured right on campus by Stanford students, uh, many who avidly experimented with pure LSD. Um, I also took other psychedelics, mushrooms, ecstasy. It, w it was legal back then. It hadn't yet been scheduled, and um, I can tell you that the intentional use of psychedelics really uh, enriched my life and was positive for me. Um, I can also tell you that um, I experimented with William Blake's maxim, the path of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. And I also learned, you know, through overindulgence, the, uh, the perils of straying too far with psychedelics. So now we're going to talk about the etymology of the term psychedelic. I'm glad Peter asked me to do this presentation because I really didn't know where the word came from. Um, it's a word that was coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond. He was a British-born psychiatrist who emigrated to Canada. Uh, and he was a pioneering psychiatrist who did some of the very first research with mescaline and LSD. Um, he also took peyote with members of the Native American church and said it was not madness, but a mystical experience. Uh, so th this is somebody who's not well known to many people in the psychedelic world, at least not to me, and uh, it's somebody who is very interesting and serves as an inspiration for you know future endeavors if you're like a psychiatrist. We're gonna hear from a psychiatrist uh, who is what I would consider maybe a modern day Humphrey Osman, Dr. Cole Marta today. Uh, so psychedelics, how are they defined? You know, according to the Oxford English dic Dictionary, it's basically a drug which produces an alteration of the mind, an apparent expansion of consciousness, often accompanied by hallucinations. Uh, and, you know, remember that reality is a consensual hallucination. In 1953, Dr. Humphrey Osmond was in correspondence with Aldous Huxley. And Humphrey Osmond came out to uh, the LA region uh, for a conference, at which point he administered 400 milligrams of mescaline to Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley uh, had his mind blown wide open by this experience, and he wrote about the, the whole mind-opening experience in The Doors of Perception, which was a seminal work, extremely influential. Uh, he described staring at a bunch of flowers and said, I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of his creation, the miracle, moment by moment, of naked existence. And I think, you know, if you um, have read uh, Naked Lunch, I think Naked Lunch is also describing that, you know, looking at that in the moment. So um, William Blake also wrote about the doors of perception, and this influenced the title of the Huxley book. 
And William Blake, uh, who uh, was tremendously influential, you know, the Doors here in Venice, uh, the Doors were influenced by William Blake. That was the name of uh, the band, the Doors. Um, if the Doors of Perception were cleansed, everything would appear to humans as it is, infinite. For humans have closed themselves up till they see all things through narrow chinks of their cavern. And so psychedelics were a way to expand awareness. Um, Huxley suggested a new word, phenerothyme, to describe substances like mescaline, which expanded awareness. And this is made from the Greek terms that indicate reveal in spirit. He wrote a little poem to say, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phenerothyme. <laughs> and Osman countered with a better one, in my opinion, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And si that comes from psyche for mind and delos for manifest. And it's basically mind manifesting. So now the path to psychedelic prohibition is kind of interesting. And it involves Timothy Leary. Um, in 1969, the US Supreme Court issued a landmark opinion in Leary versus the United States. Uh, Timothy Leary was being prosecuted for violating the, fair, the Federal Marijuana Tax Act, um, which required him to file for a tax stamp. He didn't file for a tax stamp, and he said, I can't because it's illegal under Texas law. I would be incriminating myself, and I'd, uh, this would violate the Fifth Amendment. The U.S. Supreme Court, and this was the Warren Court, agreed with them unanimously, given that it was illegal in Texas to possess marijuana, then Timothy Leary would be incriminating himself if he complied with the registration requirements of the Marijuana Tax Act. And the US Supreme Court invalidated the Marijuana Tax Act, vacated the convictions. Around the same time, it was, you know, the Summer of Love was, you know, 1968, just right before then, um, there was like a conservative backlash. And so Congress replaced the Marijuana Tax Act, which was no longer enforceable because it violated the Fifth Amendment, with the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, which was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. Um, Title II of this act was the Controlled Substances Act. So this is the birth of psychedelic prohibition, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, for the most part. You know, the, the isolated psychedelics had been prohibited before that, but this was kind of like a widespread, unitary, statutory prohibition. And it, uh, classified substances into one of five schedules. Schedule one has a high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use, and a high potential for addiction such that the drug is not safe for to use even under medical supervision. Schedule two, high potential for abuse. Yes, sometimes accepted medical use with severe restriction, and abuse can cause severe addiction. Schedule three, medium potential for abuse. Yes, accepted medical use. It can cause severe mental addiction. Schedule four, low potential for abuse. Yes, accepted medical use. Schedule five, the lowest potential for abuse. Um, and it may lead to a mild mental or physical addiction. So schedule one controlled substances, um, you know, one of them, which I don't think is physically addictive, um, cannabis, you know, was placed into Schedule One. It's a mild psychedelic. So was DMT. So was ibogaine. They're just like adding everything they could think of into its Schedule One. Uh, so was LSD. So was MDMA. And mescaline, which is the uh, psychoactive constituent of peyote and San Pedro cactus, as well as peyote itself, which is sacred to uh, maybe many Native American uh, tribes, as well as uh, psilocybin and psilocin, which are the psychoactive components of uh, psilocybin mushrooms. And here we have a picture of cubensis, but there are literally dozens of mushrooms that are psych uh, psychologic psychoactive. Then um, this is the Controlled Substances Act, you know, th the Schedule One. They basically try to add every single hallucinogenic substance they could think of to schedule one. 
with really no supporting research because a lot of these substances, they don't have a high potential for abuse for the simple reason that it, bad trips happen. And after a bad trip, people don't want to go back there. Something about the Controlled Substances Act is how Kafkaesque and arbitrary it is. Uh, so for example, cocaine, cocaine base, which is crack, PCP and fentanyl are scheduled too, meaning even though they have a high potential for abuse, yes, there's an accepted medical use with severe restrictions, although the abusing the drug can cause severe physical and mental addiction. Now, marijuana is schedule one with no accepted medical use, makes no sense at all. That, that's an old saw, we'll move on to, you know, you know, marijuana is never 100% THC. Marijuana is like some percentage of THC and then some CBD and you know, a lot of terpenes and a lot of other cannabinoids. Well, dronabinol, which is 100% THC, that's just a schedule three controlled substance. That's known as marinol. And then um, dronabinol in oral liquid form that you can drink and get super duper high, that's a schedule two controlled substance, even though that's 100% THC. So this just shows how Kafkaesque this whole classification of the schedule are. Um, now we're gonna move on to kind of like the federal mandatory minimums. You know, it's part of like this ridiculous prohibition that we're living under. Thi this is the current state of the law right now. And so there's um, a US Supreme Court case that discussed uh, um, the mandatory minimums for LSD. And you know, very briefly, you know, th this is the Chapman versus United States case, and I want to say the name of the guy who, you know, was, was sentenced to a mandatory minimum, Richard Chapman, and he was selling a Bible, 10 sheets of 1,000 doses of blotter paper containing LSD. And um, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, the weight of the LSD alone was 50 milligrams, or 0 0.050 grams, and the weight of the LSD with the blotter was 5.7 grams. The US Supreme Court held that the statute requires the weight of the carrier medium to be included when determining the appropriate sentence for trafficking in LSD. And this construction is neither a violation of due process nor unconstitutionally vague. And that basically meant that uh, based on the weight of the blotter paper, somebody was giving a mandatory minimum sentence. And if you're curious what the mandatory minimums are for LSD, um, and it's the only psychedelic that is subject to the mandatory minimums. It's right here, so a mixture, counting blotter paper, of one to nine grams is a five-year mandatory minimum for the first offense, and a 10-year mandatory minimum for the second offense. And curiously, in the Chapman case, the US Supreme Court said, this is just because the LSD is impregnated into the blotter paper and cannot be separated. If it was in a bottle, liquid LSD, then it, you would not count the weight of the bottle. So that, that's a uh, practical tip from the US Supreme Court. Don't put it in blotter, <laughs> keep it in a bottle, liquid LSD, so they don't use the weight of the carrier medium against you. If the amount is 10 grams or more, first time, clean record, 10-year mandatory minimum, second offense, 20-year mandatory minimum, and um, two or more priors, basically three strikes you're out, life imprisonment. And we still have prisoners in federal court serving time for LSD. Even though like people are engaging in schedule one distribution of marijuana and, and overlooking the classification of marijuana as schedule one, um, you know, it's with when it comes to enforcement of LSD, I think um, it's still happening. We've seen reduced enforcement. I, c I can tell you the good news is I, I haven't really seen an LSD cases case in years. There doesn't seem to be much interest in that. Now we're going to discuss cannabis legalization in California and what lessons can be learned from California uh, for thinking about how to legalize psychedelics in the future. So in California. It was the first state in the nation that really kicked off this worldwide cannabis legalization movement with Proposition 215, which legalized medical use and cultivation with a physician's recommendation or approval. In 2004, 
the legislature passed Senate Bill 420, which established the collective and cooperative defense. And at that point, the caregiver defense became increasingly rare because it was far more difficult to establish that one was a caregiver than just to show that one was a member of a collective. In 2010, in response to Proposition 19, which would have legalized marijuana, the legislature, at the behest of Governor Schwarzenegger, um, re reduced the penalties for marijuana from you know, a misdemeanor to an infraction, and it didn't really reduce the penalty. The penalty was already a $100 fine, no jail time. What it did is it took away the right to a jury trial. And my very first case was a marijuana jury trial, um, you know, processional lesson announced in Van Nuys. It took a whole week. You know, um, it was a hung jury. The prosecutor was furious that we didn't plead guilty. Um, and you know, the I could tell you, like, um, it's it was better having possession be a misdemeanor than an infraction, just because you got a jury trial. Um, in 2015, the legislature just really got sick of, of collectives and cooperatives. They basically said, this is a wild west, it's out of control, it makes no sense, and they wanted to tame the wild tiger of medical cannabis. So they passed the Medical Marijuana Regulation Safety Act, which established a regulatory framework for medical cannabis, and also set up a sunset clause for collectives, basically an expiration date. 2016, we have Prop 64, which was an adult use regulatory framework with partial um, decriminalization. So before Prop 64, cultivation of a single plant was a felony and uh, with a medical defense, but still a felony, often prosecuted in court with a medical defense and often ended up resolving as a misdemeanor. After Prop 64, most cultivation became a misdemeanor. There's, you know, a million plants now is a misdemeanor if the person is over 21. Um, and so law enforcement lost their enthusiasm for prosecuting cannabis cases while it's still illegal. Um, and now there's like a regulatory framework. So in 2017, the legislature said, we don't want to have a separate framework for medical and a separate set of regulations for adult. We're going to unify both frameworks. And um, this resulted in the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. 2018, we had the state issuing licenses for commercial cannabis activity. Regulatory rulemaking began, and now we have a new set of regulations. And remember, in January 9, 2019, the collective and cooperative defense will expire, and we can anticipate there's going to be an increase in enforcement. But the way cannabis was legalized in California, it was not legalized. It was a partial reduction in the penalties, and then this onerous, um, highly regulated system that is akin to the way that plutonium is regulated. It's over-regulated. And why am I bringing this, this up? These are lessons that need to be learned when we think about um, legalizing psychedelics. Maybe not repeat, not use the same model for cannabis. So now we're going to discuss the California initiative process because the way th that cannabis legalization was kicked off worldwide was not by changing the federal law. The federal representatives are not responsive to the will of the people. It was through voter initiatives. The first one was Prop 215 in 1996, and the second one was Prop 64 in 2016 because the legislature wouldn't do it. They did not have the political will. And I feel it's the same thing wi when it comes to psychedelics and other controlled substances. There is not the will for politicians who are constantly thinking about re-election, and maybe this is something where the citizens need to take the initiative. So the initiative process in California, to get an initiative on the ballot, you need 5% of the people who voted um, for governor. And at the very last election, which was November 6, we had 7,213,464 people. So you really need 360,000, you know, plus or minus uh, signatures to get on the ballot. Um, how do you draft the language of the initiative? Well, the California Government Code has something very handy. It requires the Legislative Council to cooperate with proponents of an initiative 
in preparing the initiative when requested and writing to do so by 25 or more electors, electors just means registered voters, proposing the measure. And so basically 25 people would get together, they would draft the language for the initiative, and then you can go to the Legislative Council and they will help you come up with the language to effectuate the aims of the initiative. I found this incredibly helpful when I was writing marijuana legalization initiatives in uh, 2016, 2010, 2012. You know, I, I uh, authored many, none of which got on the ballot, but had they gotten on the ballot, we would have seen like more radical legalization than what we have now. Um, and then this is to prevent people from coming in with a, what if the UFOs land initiative? And would you please write an initiative for you know the government when the UFOs land? It has to be something where the Legislative Council thinks there's reasonable probability that the measure will be submitted to the voters of the state under the laws relating to the submission of initiatives. So basically, you gotta have a, a decent shot at getting those signatures for them to help you. They're not gonna be just writing hypothetical initiatives or you know, like the unconstitutional initiative, the guy who wanted to shoot gay people, the Legislative Council will not get involved in that. Um, drafting the language, language of the initiative, you know, um, working with the Legislative Council as I have, there is a person who would be in charge of, you know, um, I guess look helping people if there was an initiative, and, and that's Jacob Henninger, and um, he has advised um, many initiative drafters, and he is somebody who I can tell you is receptive to the idea of criminal justice reform, and he would be happy and honored to start working on a psychedelic reform initiative. Um, and so an idea that I'm proposing is the idea of, of a California Cognitive Liberty Initiative. And um, this is based on a term that was coined by Richard Glenn Barr and um, his partner, neuroethicist Dr. Rice Intentia, and they're founders of the nonprofit Center for Cognitive Liberty and Ethics. And so they came up with a really cool idea, which I'd like to share. It's the idea of cognitive liberty, which is the right of each individual to think independently and autonomously, to use the full power of his or her mind, and to engage in multiple modes of thought. And this means um, the right to use controlled substances to explore human consciousness. This also means the right to be autonomous and not have you know, the artificial drugging of people for psychiatric reasons. And, and um, you know, so I, I think this is like an initiative um, that, it's an idea that whose time has come. And I asked Dr. or I asked Richard Lamboire, will you come in here and will you talk about this? And he's like, no, I kind of moved on to other things, you know, but you can go ahead and talk about it. Um, and so I would like you to kind of like, if you can get a chance, please spread on the you know this idea of cognitive liberty and just start researching it. It's a great idea. It's kind of libertarian. You know, the idea is that nobody should tell you what to think, and that these psychedelic substances give you th the ability to have completely different thoughts that you could not have otherwise. And it's your right as a human being who wants to engage in uh, your exploration of your own consciousness to be allowed to use these substances in the privacy of your own space as long as you hurt nobody. It, I think it's, it's a very appealing idea and um, I wanna spread that idea. And um, this brings us back to Dr. Humphrey Osmond who thought that psychedelics could help humanity. You know, he said, I believe that psychedelics provide a chance, perhaps only a slender one, for homo faber, that's like the, the human who builds, uh, the cunning, ruthless, foolhardy, pleasure-greedy toolmaker to merge into that other creature whose presence we so rashly presumed, homo sapiens, the wise, the understanding, the compassionate, in whose fourfold vision art, politics, science, and religion are one. So that's kind of the idea of, uh, you know, the, the promise of...